Welcome to today's episode, everybody. Um, we're pleased to have our guest today as um, Scooter Sayers, president of Sayers Logistics. And um, Scooter, thanks for being on the podcast with us today. Yeah, thanks, um, Aaron. Appreciate it. Starting out, do you want to just kind of introduce yourself to everybody, um, where you grew up, where you're from, and um, maybe some things you enjoy? Yeah, sure. So um, I grew up uh, as, as a kid in the, uh, in the Carolinas of Virginia, um, pretty much grew up within 30 minutes of the, uh, of the coast uh, as, as a child. Uh, my dad was a Marine, so we, we moved from, uh, from place to place along the eastern seaboard every couple of years. He was, from, he was born and raised in Arkansas, so when he retired from the Marine Corps, uh, when I was in junior high, we relocated to Arkansas. And that was a, that was a big transition for me because I grew up eating crab and eating fish, seafood all my life. And when I moved to Arkansas, uh, seafood was, uh, was catfish. So I had to go transition from living close to the beach to being a thousand miles away from the beach. But I uh, lived in Arkansas for many, many years. Uh, I, I love that state. It's a, it's a great, beautiful state has some of the best trout fishing in the world. Um, I went to college at University of Arkansas, got an industrial engineering degree. I got an MBA at, uh, at the University of Arkansas. Um, I ended up working at Arkansas Best Freight or ABF Freight for about 25 years, big LTL carrier uh, based in Arkansas. Uh, and a lot of what I do even today is was really guided by what I learned at that company. They've got a couple of uh, very basic fundamentals that they teach everybody that works there that has stuck with me even today. So they're really big about quality. They're really big about what they call dirt foot or doing it right the first time. Um, and they're really big about not just fixing problems, but solving the root cause of problems. And that's still, like I said, it's still very foundational and fundamental about what I do and shapes a lot about what I do today. And as we get into uh, this uh, podcast today, talking about some things, a lot of what I talk about will circle back to those basic fundamentals. So again, I worked at ABF in uh, uh, LTL, LTL carrier for about 25 years. That was mostly in the, uh, in the pricing realm. Everything has to do with pricing LTL freight, uh, including uh, a weighing, managing the weighing research department, which is responsible for validating uh, what's on the bill of lading that customers tender uh, and ensuring that it's correct uh, because that drives the revenue that the carriers generate. Uh, I left ABF a couple years ago, relocated to the Atlanta area uh, a couple years ago. I worked for a couple of other companies, including working for some 3PLs in the LTL space. And for the last two or three years, I've been doing contracting and, and consulting work on my own with Sarah's Logistics. Um, I spend most of my time today working with um, small to medium sized 3PLs that either are trying to move into the LTL space or they are in LTO, but they're trying to step up their game. I help them connect with the carriers, understand how the carriers operate, the differences between carriers. Um, I help them negotiate pricing and contracts um, and work on their backend systems so that they uh, can give their customers a good LTL experience. Um, I work with uh, medium to large uh, LTL shippers that are looking to optimize their, their LTL spend, optimize and uh, reduce their LTL spend. A lot of them are typically looking to try to get better pricing from their carriers, which is definitely something you can do. But I, I tend to spend more time working with them on the innards of their business rather than their carrier interactions. What can they do to make things better internally? Uh, because if they can fix things on their side, especially things that help the carriers out, they can curry more favor with their carriers by showing them that they really are a true partner. Um, so I do, I do a, work, a lot of work with shippers, a lot of work with 3PLs, and I do a bit of work with uh, different technology players within the LTL space today, too. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm a little curious, what uh, prompted you to go out on your own and start your consulting firm after you'd been, I guess, in the LTL industry for so long? Yeah, you know, so they say, you know, that, uh, that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, I was actually uh, between jobs. I had uh, left one employer. Uh, I had spoken with a friend of mine about that. And the next day he called me up and said, hey, I know these, these, uh, these, th this, this small company, they're parcel consultants. They're wanting to branch into LTL and they're looking for someone to help them understand LTL. And I've got a job today. I can't help them, but you told me that you're not working and you're looking for a new job. So 
you want, you want to maybe reach out to them and help them. And so I did. And that was my first consulting uh, 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 gig that I did. And it kind of got my feet wet and learning how to do that. And as time went on, I really enjoyed doing that kind of work. I really enjoyed being able to work with someone across the country uh, and, and being able to do that without having to fly there and work with them. I liked not having to be at a specific place. And I liked the fact that they were reaching out to me for my expertise and I was able to give them that expertise. And so it was a great win-win for us because I was able to work you know, at home as needed and give them my expertise. And so it kind of grew from there and I picked up another client, another client, another client. And so that's, that's what I do today. And I really enjoy that aspect of anybody across, not just across the country, but across the world. I'm working with companies that are not even based in the United States and they're wanting to understand the US LTL market. And they're trying to find uh, that expert that can help them with it. And not that I'm the best expert out there to do it, but I, I am someone with some knowledge. And today it's easy to find someone like that if you're not caught up into where they're located at or them having to be, you know, within my domicile to, uh, to make an arrangement happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, so with all that experience in the LTL freight world, um, I was curious what, are some, I'm sure you have a lot of, I guess, horror stories. I don't know a better way to put it, but of a freight you've seen, you've seen shipped that just arrived completely destroyed or the craziest thing that you've seen someone try to ship. Do you have anything you care to share? Um, you know, I actually do have some, a couple of pretty, uh, pretty good horror stories. One of the, in my role at ABF, uh, one of the things that I got involved with was, watching over uh, what they call their prohibited articles list. Every carrier has got a list of articles or commodities that they don't want to handle. Um, um, cadavers and dead bodies, radioactive material, um, you know, waste, you know, they don't, we don't want to haul trash. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so some of them, it makes sense, right? We don't want to haul uh, dead bodies. We don't want to haul live animals, you know, don't, don't ship your pet tiger LTL. Um, <laughs> Uh, but there's other things that you might not think of. And um, one of the things that I, that I got involved with that was really, really grotesque was um, you out in, out in the West where you've got a lot of hunting going on for deer, moose or whatnot. There's, there's a lot of trade that goes on about processing those animals and the hides, you know, being sent off to be tanned somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, um, unfortunately, we ended up getting a couple of loads of, of, of uh, deer hides that were fresh deer hides. And, um, you know, they're, they're a little smelly, a little hairy, a little bloody, and they yeah. uh, really make a mess of a trailer. And so um, that was, a, that was a one part of my job was trying to make sure that if anyone tried to tender something like that to us, that we would snuff it out and stop it before it happened. But we were not always successful. So every now and then we would get that shipment. And once we were done, we would have to go send that trailer off to get it uh, cleaned and fumigated before it could be reintroduced back into the into the treasure pool. So, yeah, I've tanned a beaver hide once in my life, and uh, mm -hmm. through through YouTube, and I can tell, I can attest, it's a messy um, yeah. experience. So, th so think about having eight pallets stacked four foot high of nothing but fresh deer hides, and uh, yeah. what that's going to do to a trailer. So, so awesome, great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so over the past couple months, uh, specifically, there's been a lot going on in the LTL world um, with changes to pricing models and um, commodity codes, um, things of that nature. Um, I wanted to start off with uh, FedEx Freight and Old Dominion Freight Lines both mm -hmm. made announcements recently about um, trial programs to adjust their pricing programs, or they've rolled out, I guess, programs to price based on dimensional weight, um, or mm. profile based pricing. Mm. Um, and I've read a couple articles that, um, that you shared as well as others have, have talked a lot about it. Um, maybe for those who aren't familiar with, I guess, the standard way that pricing has worked, can you explain, I guess, kind of what commodity codes, how pricing has worked in the past and what a dimensional based pricing model, um, would look like? Yeah, sure. So uh, today in LTL, it's very common for customers to have their freight charges determined by a classification system. Uh, the, there's an organization called the NMFTA or the National Motor Freight 
Traffic Association. They've got a group within their that entity. They're an entity that promotes the LTL industry, and they and they do a really good job of codifying and standardizing a lot about how the LTL industry works, uh, and not just LTL, but really even trucking in general. So every every carrier, uh, every carrier, even truckload carrier, tends to have what's called a SCAT code, an SCAC code. It's a four character code that's unique to them, and you go to the NMFTA to get that code. It allows it allows uh, shippers and carriers to do business together in standard ways because you can refer to that SCAT code to identify that carrier. So from the commodity side, um, the NMFTA and their and their subgroup, the NMFC, the National Motor Freight Classification, they they uh, take any item that may ship in an LTL environment and they code it to a specific item. And there's about I think about five thousand different items. So in theory. Anything that you're shipping LTL, you go to their book, which is about two or three inches thick, and you should be able to find the specific item that describes that commodity. And then once you find that, it assigns a class to that commodity, and the classes can range from 50 to 500. There's 18 different classes. Um, and those classes, um, as the class goes up, the pricing gets more expensive. So class 50 is going to be the cheapest rate. Class 500 is going to be the most uh, expensive rate. And those classes are dictated by density, by stowability, by handling, and by liability. Density is the biggest driver of that because with LTL, space is what really drives cost, especially with line haul. But other things that, that matter are going to be stowability. How easy is it to put that object in the trailer? Is it, is it a pallet or is it a 25-foot long telephone pole? Uh, handling is a, is a characteristic. And that you know same thing applies there if it's a long object it's harder to handle on the dock than it is if it's a regular pallet and then liability has to do with the uh, propensity to be damaged or lost or stolen you know the greater that liability risk is the higher the class is going to be but most of the time density is what really drives the cost because most of what's moving ltl today is moving on pallets it's palletized freight in boxes and so density rather than handling or stowing or liability is the big uh, cost driver Okay. So with their changes or I guess pilot programs that they're rolling out, what specifically changes from that commodity code to the dimensional mm -hmm. based pricing models? Yeah. So what's, what's happened over the last couple of years is that a number of carriers have begun rolling out uh, pricing programs that are not tied to the NMF classification. They're tied more to the profile of the freight, the actual weight of the pallet, the actual dimensions of the pallet, how long is the pallet, uh, the packaging type. Um, and they're, they're doing that in a, as a means to simplify pricing. Uh, so one, one uh, large LTL carrier has rolled a program out that does this, and it's a pretty popular program for it. They're using it for most of their 3PL business, for transactional 3PL business. They rolled this model out for those 3PLs, and for those 3PLs, their customers don't have to worry so much about what the class is. They just have to uh, upfront know what the weight of the pallets are and the dims of the pallet are, and they get their quote for that carrier. And as long as their weights and dims match what the carrier finds, then the quote and the invoice are going to match up and everyone's going to be happy because what they, the invoice they got in the mail matches up to their expectations. So carriers are beginning to do that more and more, and they're beginning to show a propensity to move away from the NMF because it's very complex. Again, it's two or three inches thick, and it's really hard for shippers to keep up with this very complex, archaic uh, methodology of classifying freight. In too, in too many cases, you have to know what is the product made of? What is the intended use? I mean, the class can vary based upon whether it's used for household purposes or commercial purposes, and that gets to be very subjective at times. It's a lot simpler to, uh, to class or price based upon the weight and the density of a pallet, uh, weight in the dims of a pallet. That's much more objective. It's easier to determine what that is. And so that's what you're seeing FedEx and Old Dominion here recently talking about is rolling out a pricing program where it's based upon the profile and not the class. And so all you need is the weight in the dims of the pallet. And as long as you know what they are and you, and you use that for your quote and you put that on the bill of lading, my invoice to you is going to be in alignment with what you expect it to be. Okay. So, um, does class play a factor at all? And I'm just thinking of a shipment that 
say something's fragile on top of the pallet. Mm -hmm. And so you can't, and it's maybe kind of a weird shape. So you can't stack anything on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, would that still ship just based on its profile or would there be some type of class or classification as well? Yeah, good question. I think, um, I don't think we have all the details yet. Uh, you know, the, the, these two carriers have announced their pilot programs. They're testing them out. Um, I'm, I'm sure that what they end up rolling out to the public will be a little bit different than what they rolled out as part of the pilot. Uh, I suspect what they will be doing is uh, really uh, trying to set aside things like the liability aspect, you know, the uh, easy to damage item on top. Um, probably if you are going to use this program in order to get the benefits of a more of a simpler pricing program, you're also going to have to um, uh, account for things like the uh, the liability aspect of it. So they'll probably roll these programs out with uh, a limited liability package like uh, $2 per pound and also offer up for the shipper a means of getting uh, supplemental insurance to cover loss and damage. And it'll be up for the shipper to account for all that. Um, I don't think they will introduce class at all into it. I think they really want to try to roll these programs out where class just doesn't play a role at all. So it's really going to be weight, DIMMs, packaging type. And then if you need extra insurance because you're afraid that your, uh, your shipment may be fragile, you have to go uh, purchase that supplement insurance on your own and you have to pay for it because you've got more fragile freight. Whereas if you're shipping a pallet of bricks, you're probably not too worried about them being damaged. Yeah. So putting myself in a shipper's shoes, I would think that this would be a welcome change um, just for the simplicity factor of it, mm -hmm. um, that it'd be easier to get, I guess, an, an accurate quote from carriers and not have to go through that. Like you mentioned, that booklet, it's two or three inches thick and try and figure out or read their mind as to how they would classify your freight. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see it that way as the, this is a benefit to shippers? And if you were a shipper, how would you respond, I guess, to take advantage or put, position mm -hmm. yourself correctly for these changes? Yeah, I think for a shipper, it, it does definitely simplify things. For If I'm a shipper, um, I don't need to train my warehouse personnel, or my people that are filling out the bill of lading. I don't have to train them on the NMFC and how to use it. I don't have to gain access to the NMFC and and uh, show them how to keep up with it. Uh, when when changes are made every couple of months, I don't have to keep up with that, you know, with, uh, with the possibility that the one or two commodities that we ship may get changed next month and I don't realize it. Um, you also got to account for all the varying uh, carrier rules and their rules tariffs. Um, and a lot of those rules are designed to protect the carrier from classification issues uh, like a, a commodity that's not been uh, refreshed in a while or uh, pricing like an FAK that doesn't compensate the carrier properly. Um, so with these new programs that Old Dominion and FedEx are rolling out, you're not going to be using these old uh, longstanding um, classification type pricing uh, tools or implementations like an FAK anymore. Every shipment is going to be priced based upon its own profile. And so it just makes it easier for the, for the shippers to not have to keep up with all of these very difficult uh, rules uh, and classifications that, uh, that they have to today. They just need to know how to measure and weigh their freight. And that's going to be the, probably the biggest challenge is that for the shippers to take it the full advantage of these simplified programs, they will have to get really good about knowing what their pallets, weights, and dims are as they're being tendered to the carrier. So I've, in some of the things that I've read that you've posted, um, in, I guess, response to this announcement by F FedEx and, and old dominion, you've talked a lot about the importance for shippers and becoming a shipper of choice, mm -hmm. um, and, and gaining that designation for my own benefit. Is that something that, um, carriers like award, to the shipper or is it just some like kind of behind the scenes, they consider you the shipper of choice and they, they give you better rates or I guess, how does that work and what's required to become a shipper of choice? Yeah, I think, I think that whole concept is gaining a lot of steam. And I think that the carriers by and large, all the OTL carriers, regardless of how big or small they are, national, regional, I think they, uh, they're getting really good at collecting data and understanding their customers. Uh, I think they're getting really good understanding which customers are good, which customers are bad, which customers uh, make their life easy, which customers allow them to make a profit. 
And I think in each one of these carriers is different. So you can't just color every carrier the same just because they all are an LTL carrier. Uh, some carriers focus on getting residential freight. Some carriers don't want residential freight. So each one of them is unique in their own right. And they're learning which customers are best for them. And they're learning even today more and more, how do I reward or incentivize those customers to operate the way that I want them to operate? And one of the ways of doing that, which we're hearing a lot of uh, talk about is the electronic bill of lading, is getting that, that bill of lading data uh, electrified, uh, digitized, so that it doesn't have to be rekeyed over and over again. Uh, today, a lot of bill of ladings are being hand entered by the carriers after they pick up freight. They want that data to be fed to them electronically. And not only do they want it to be fed to them electronically, but they want that data to be fed to them before they even pick up the freight so they know exactly what to expect. And if you've got a shipper that is really good about knowing their the, the dimensions and the weights of their pallets, um, and they're feeding that data to the carrier before the carrier picks it up, the carrier can now begin to plan for that. They can now figure out, do I need to send another delivery driver out on that route to go pick up freight because this shipper has more freight than normal that to go pick up. They can then take that, that uh, data and they can begin optimizing their line haul network for later that night with that data rather than what they do today, which is get the freight back to the terminal, measure it and weigh it, and then use it for optimization purposes. So having that data up front before the carrier even picks up the freight is so beneficial to the carriers that over time, the ones that value that data will find ways to recognize those shippers as a shipper choice and reward them for providing that data. So carriers value that electronic bill of lading and sounds like it's something that they've wanted for a long time. Yeah. Um, do shippers push back against that for any reason? Or why is that, I guess, not happening all the time right now? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's shippers can push back because they may not have a way of, of, of uh, utilizing the electronic bill of lading, but really there's no reason why they can't do that now. If, if, a, if the shipper is using a TMS, a transportation management system, that TMS should be able to adopt the electronic bill of lading standard. Uh, if they're not using a TMS, in the past, they could argue that there's too much cost involved to do that. But today, you really can't even argue that because there are, are literally uh, options for them that are very free, totally free. Most LTL carriers have a means of putting a TMS in their shipper's hands. So today, most any LTL shipper can utilize a TMS that has very little cost and will give them access to providing that electronic bill lading uh, to to uh, to their carrier, either getting a TMS on their own, or if they work with a 3PL, that 3PL will have a TMS that can do that for them. Okay. So I guess for my shoes, and my involvement is is uh, very minimal in the LTL shipping and freight world, but I kind of see the dimensional based pricing change as a win win for carrier and shipper alike, and mm. then, so it kind of makes me curious as to why. Um, it's just rolling out now and hasn't happened previously. And if um, you anticipate that there will be any pushback from either side, either carriers who haven't adjusted mm -hmm. to it yet and aren't rolling out programs yeah. like that or shippers. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think, I think me, myself and, and many others in the industry, uh, we, we think this is a long time coming. We, I think a lot of us uh, expected when, when FedEx and UPS moved into the world of LTL about 10, 15 years ago, a lot of us expected that they would flex their muscles and show everyone how to parcelize LTL, but, but they didn't do it. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. You know, number one, it's really hard to implement change in LTL because you really have to do it customer by customer. No carrier can go out there and just tomorrow say, we're going to do everything this way for everyone. It's, 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 it's more complicated. It's too complicated to be able to do that. Um, the other thing is um, there really needed to be a level of data that the carriers had within, within, within their four walls to be able to pull this off. And I think that carriers like Old Dominion, carriers like FedEx, they are now at a point where they're dimensioning the majority of the freight moving through their network. And so they can offer dimensional based pricing because, uh, you know, one of the requirements for this pricing to work, this, this profile based pricing is you, the shipper are going to have to tell them what the dims and the weight are and even in order to even get a quote. And so they're going to, they're going to have that data coming into them. 
And they now have the capability of re -weigh, of weighing and dimensionalizing most of the freight moving to their network to verify what you're telling them is correct. And I think we're finally at a pivot point where the carriers by and large have that capability where they can do dimensional pricing. If they tried to do it three or four years ago, they wouldn't have been dimensioning enough freight to really pull it off uh, successfully. So I think that's what's really driving it is that the technology mm -hmm. has allowed the carriers to get to the point where they really can offer this kind of, of solution because they can verify mm -hmm. that they're doing it right. Yeah. Okay. I, I wanted to touch too on another, I guess, major change that's happened in the past couple of months. Um, and that is with the NMFTA and mm -hmm. um, the classification process. So they've announced some changes. I don't know exactly what all of those are, but, um, in, in an article that I think you, you wrote, actually, they, you mentioned that they're moving more towards density based pricing as well. Um, I was wondering if that is more is in response to the carriers and their announcements of rolling out these pricing programs, or I don't know if it's more what came first, the chicken or the egg, you know, that mm -hmm. they roll out these changes and then the carriers responded or did the carriers move and kind of force the hand of the NMFTA? Yeah, I, th I think it all works together. You know, the NMFTA is is an, is a body that supports the LTL industry. Uh, they they support the carriers. Uh, they're there to support the shippers, and I think they're listening. Um, they've got some new leadership uh, at the NMFTA, and one of the things that uh, that new leader did was did some surveying amongst the stakeholders within the industry, uh, reaching out to three PLs, reaching out to shippers, reaching out to carriers and finding out what, what those entities think that the NMFTA needs to do. And that was one of the things that they spoke to was uh, you need to simplify the classification system. It's, it's, uh, it's operating the same way it did when it came out in the 1930s. Uh, here it is. It's for 2022. We need to catch up. And so they recognize that, and that's what they're talking about doing. And a lot of what they're talking about doing right now, if I understand things, is they're, they're trying to take large categories of items where, you know, let's take uh, – uh, clothing, for example, there may be there may be 50 different items in the NMF that pertain to some type of clothing, whether it's a, a shirt or a T-shirt or a fabric or, uh, you know, jeans, whatever you want to call it. There may be 50 different items that pertain to that. And it's too complex because you got to be able to decide what is my specific item I'm shipping. They're talking about taking those items and bundling them all together under one master item. And its class, its classification will be driven by density, and so that's what they're doing, and that's the direction they were already they've already been going for for many years is moving towards classifying by density. They're really talking about uh, fast forwarding the process, and when you think about today, I'm guessing that about 75% of freight that moves LTL gets classed by density. So we're really we're really almost there already. They're just kind of pushing everything over the ledge and really kind of building the, uh, the momentum to get everything classed by density that needs to be classed by density. And when you think about it, again, if it moves in a box on a pallet, it probably needs to be classed by density. And that's, that's what they're recognizing. Now, one of the challenges is um, you've still got this dichotomy of the fact that uh, the classification system originally founded off of classifying objects like the, the box of T-shirts. You know, so you still have this world we're living in where in some cases I have to class the commodity by the box itself. In other cases, I have to class it by the pallet itself. And that's part of the, part of what they still have to work on fixing is getting everything changed so that we're classifying LTL freight based upon the, the weight and the uh, dimensions of the actual pallets and not the cartons that are on the pallets. Okay. Um so as this shifting is happening, kind of from classification process to a dimensional based or profile based pricing model, um, you wrote an article to kind of address the, you, you title it the shipper, shipper carrier pledge. And if it's mm -hmm. time for that to happen, mm -hmm. um, and kind of just, as I was reading through it, um, I was just kind of thinking, you know, is this, is it realistic that this will happen? Can they get along well enough and trust each other enough to take a pledge like that? Mm -hmm. um, I, and I was curious your thoughts, and I know you, you wrote the article, but do you believe that that is going to happen soon in the future or later or never? I'm mm -hmm. just curious your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, you know, the way I see it working out is that um, um, I can see a, a carrier um, coming to the conclusion that I just need to figure out what what I'm going to call good enough. You know, it's if you 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 can put a pallet in front of you and me, and if we have got a scale, we will come up with the same weight. But the problem gets to be that I can weigh it at my warehouse, but if you then take the pallet back to your dock and you weigh it on a different scale, you're probably going to get a slightly different weight. Okay, and so maybe maybe I say the pallet weighs 500 pounds, you take it back to your dock and it's 510 pounds. Is that good enough? Can we call it? Can we call that 500 pounds and move on, or are you going to charge me extra because you found 10 extra pounds? Um, if we measure that pallet, uh, I come up with uh, X, Y, and Z dims. You take it back to your terminal and you come up with something slightly different. Uh, as long as we're the, we're within an inch or so, can we call that good, or are you going to penalize me and charge me different because you found a different dimension? So I think that what we're going to find is carriers are going to figure out how to put that halo or that amount of grace around what the shipper tells them and call it good and move on rather than dinging them for finding a difference. And not necessarily having to have a, a signed pledge. It's just an understood pledge that as long as you're, as long as you give me good enough data, you know, we don't have to match perfectly, but as long as what you give me is really good, then I'm going to call it good and we're going to move, we're going to move on from there. But you know, the carrier is going to say, I'm going to be checking. And if I find that you're not doing a very good job, then, you know, the, the pledge is out the door. I've, I've got to, at some point, compensate myself for what you're tendering me. And if you're giving me bad data, I've got I've got to fix that. You know, the, the, the question is going to be is where do where do they find that halo, that band that we can play in in the, in the sandbox together and, and be happy that we both are doing the same thing? Yeah. And hopefully the relationship is, you know, is more important than the couple mm -hmm. extra bucks that they could charge for yeah, a half yeah. inch off or whatever. Yeah. You know, to me, the, the whole thing here is that the, the issue of the invoice not matching the quote, uh, the, the rebuild, the reclass, the charge back, whatever you want to call it, that pain that's created between the shipper and the carrier uh, because the shipper's invoice is more than they expected. It, it creates a lot of conflict. It creates conflict between the two. It creates uh, delays in payments. It causes uh, carriers to write money off. It causes shippers to uh, switch from carrier X to carrier Y because they're upset. It creates a lot of friction. And if we can get to where we can agree on things and put that trust back into the equation, then we're not going to see that happening as much. And I think everybody wants that to happen. The carriers, they just want to go haul freight. They don't want to have to spend so much time fighting to get paid. And the shippers don't want to spend a lot of time fighting over freight bills. So I think there's a, a lot of interest in both sides finding a better way of doing things and, uh, and and not having to spend so much time fighting over what the freight charges are. Yeah. Um, with the current state of the economy, and um, we've all kind of seen, especially with tech companies, major layoffs happening, um, it's also infected the LTL industry to mm -hmm. some degree. Um, we've seen recent layoffs at some of the bigger companies um, and some companies announcing that they're going to kind of stall things or hold off or hit the brakes, you know, on an expansion, maybe in 2023. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious what your take is on the current state of LTL um, and what you see for the future, maybe next year and then um, the years following. Yeah, I think uh, I think the uh, I think the LTL industry is in a, is in a good spot. I think that uh, uh, they've got a nice wide runway. Even though the economy is uh, is kind of giving us all signals of some pullbacks, um, there's still a lot of things working in LTL's favor. Uh, E-commerce, uh, the need to get freight positioned closer to the uh, the end consumer. Uh, LTL is just a great flexible means of moving moving product from point A to point B. Um, if you if it's if it's bigger than a box uh, and it's smaller than a full trailer, it's still just a great economical way of moving freight around and the carriers are getting better and better at doing it. So I think they've got a, a great run, runway. And uh, I think that, you know, what, what we're seeing and hearing in the press is we're hearing a, a lot of different things. So we've got, you know, some companies are, you know, furloughing drivers, which I'm a little concerned about that, to be honest, because drivers are so critical to an LTL carrier. And if you uh, if you furlough a driver, um, 
what is that driver going to do? Is he going to sit tight at home and not get paid and wait till you call him back? Or is he going to go find something else to do? So you furlough a driver. If you get to where you need that driver back, he or she might not be available to you. So I'd rather see carriers rather than furloughing drivers. I'd rather see them finding ways to keep those drivers on the books and, uh, you know, maybe not be so focused on your profit margins, but more focused on your long term success of having the people that you need to be there when you need them to be there. So I'm a little concerned about that. But when I see some of the other carriers talking about uh, adjusting their CapEx, maybe slowing down their, their growth plans, that makes perfect sense. You know, they're trying to keep capacity available for customers so that when a customer calls up and says, can you haul my freight today? They've got capacity, but they also got to be careful of not overbuilding in the face of, of a downturn. And so I see some carriers talking about pulling back on their CapEx makes perfect sense. You just, you need to modulate that up and down as, as you sense where the market's going. And that's, that's just good business. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for your time today. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask, um, if there, what's something that you wish you were asked about more in regards to LTL that people don't key in on enough? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I tend to get involved in, uh, challenges or problems that people have with LTL. And it's real easy to, uh, to look at the negative, you know, that, you know, uh, whether it's uh, um, freight not being picked up on time, not being picked up, uh, damaged, uh, pricing increases. Uh, it's real easy to, to focus on the negative. But when you really pull back and look at what LTL does, it is a, it is a very complex orchestration that takes place out there. And the carriers, they really do an amazing job. And so I think, you know, it's, it's one of those where if, if a carrier goes out there and picks up the freight perfectly, delivers it perfectly, the invoice matches the expectation, they don't get enough pats on the back for doing a job well done. What they do, though, is that if it's late or it's not on time or, uh, you know, the invoice is higher than expected, that's where you start hearing things. And I think that there's just too many cases where the LTL carriers today, day in and day out, they block and tackle, they get the job done but they just don't get the credit that they deserve. And if you really pull everything back and look at it, I think you can really grow to appreciate what those carriers do. And so that, that'd be one thing I wish. I wish everyone had a, a greater appreciation for the wonderful job that the carriers really do, because that's what they want to do. They want to go out there and make the customer happy. And if they're, if they're late on a delivery or something happens, it's not like they're intentionally trying to do it because they don't care. It's just that it's complex. It's complicated what they do. Yeah. Yeah, I think of that as like a kicker in football. When you do well, nobody recognizes it, but when you miss, everybody knows. <laughs> yep, yep, that's yeah, right, that's so. right, exactly. So I'd, I'd put them both in the same in the same bucket. You know, th those kickers in the NFL, they are amazing, but they miss one field goal, one extra point, and the whole world falls apart, right? Yeah, you so. forget everything good they've done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Scooter, thanks for your time today. Um, if you're a, a 3PL or a medium to small size shipper. Um, you can reach Scooter um, through Sayers Log Logistics, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and reach out to him for help. He obviously um, knows his stuff when it comes to the LD LTL industry. So thanks for your time today, Scooter. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Appreciate you having me on.